you see. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, Hubby Church. It's good to see everyone this morning. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and grab them. Turn to the book of Luke with me. Again, as Pastor Tyler mentioned earlier, welcome to all of our guests. We are so delighted to have you here with us today. And as Pastor Tyler also mentioned, I'm going to be in the Connect Center uh, here in our lobby following today's service. We'd love to meet you. And we also uh, have a Knowing Highview class immediately following today's service. We would love to have you come and learn more about what it means to be a member of Highview Church and also what is Highview Church all about. So with that said, our text for today is Luke chapter 8, starting in verse 43. And I'm going to read through verse 48, and then we're going to pray together. Luke chapter 8, starting in verse 43, and the scripture reads, And there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years. And though she had spent all of her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. And she came up behind him, that's Jesus, and touched the fringe of his garment. And immediately, her discharge of blood ceased. And Jesus said, who was it that touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds surround you and are pressing in on you. But Jesus said, someone touched me, for I perceive that power has gone out from me. And when the woman saw that she was not hidden. She came trembling and falling down before him, declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Would you pray with me? Father, what we do not know, teach us. Father, what we have not, give us. What we are not, Holy Father, make us for your Son's sake. Amen. When you spend long periods of time studying one specific book of the Bible, you begin to notice small details some patterns that play out time and time again. Things you would probably not notice if you just took a cursory glance at a passage of Scripture. And one of the things I have noticed as I've studied the Gospel of Luke over almost a year now, weekly, is just how often Jesus is interrupted. It happens over and over again. And over again throughout the Gospels. In these narratives, no one seems to care that Jesus is busy. That that his public ministry on earth was only going to last 36 months or so. That he didn't have a lot of time to waste. No one seems bothered by bothering Jesus. I mean, at one point in Luke 5, if you remember... He is preaching in someone's house. And while he is preaching in someone's house, men on the roof start destroying that house. Now, now as a preacher, I can easily visualize how this interruption played out. Something like uh, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. Things start coming through the roof to the floor. It it looks like pieces are being removed. As I was saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. What are you guys doing up there, right? Just come on down. And they did. If you recall, a man is lowered down. Jesus heals him. His friends are commended as those possessing great faith. Here's the truth, like no one likes to be interrupted. But in today's passage, we we come to a story where Jesus is clearly interrupted, but for a very specific 
purpose. And here's how we're going to break this sermon up. Very simple. Part one, interrupting Jesus. Part two, healing power. So let's get right to work. Look at me at Luke chapter 8, verse 40. This verse kind of sets the scene for this particular story. Verse 40 says, Now when Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. Now as Pastor Josh mentioned in last week's sermon, Jesus had just returned from a cross-cultural mission trip, if you will, across the Sea of Galilee to the land of the Gerasenes, a land of pagans and Gentiles. And now he is back in the Galilee, where he had spent the majority of his ministry, where he had grown up. And apparently while he was gone, Jesus' fame had only intensified in this particular region. By the time he gets back from the land of the Gerasenes, the crowds are in a frenzy to see him. He's immediately swamped with needy people who are clawing at him from all sides. This chapter ends with two stories of Jesus healing two very desperate people. But interestingly, one healing story is kind of stuffed right in the middle of another healing story. Now, there's only one reason why Luke and Matthew and Mark include the story and lay it out this way, because it doesn't make the most narrative sense. There's only one reason to do that. This is how it happened. And so this is how they include it. This is how they record it. Jesus is being mobbed by a crowd of people when the ruler of a local synagogue, he comes up to Jesus in verses 41 and 42, and we read this. There came a man named Jairus who was a ruler of the synagogue, and falling at Jesus' feet, he implored him to come to his house, for he had an only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. As Jesus went, the people pressed around him. So here we have this man of impressive stature in the Jewish community coming and prostrating himself before Jesus, bowing before Jesus, pleading with him to come and heal his daughter who was dying. Now, if you have not done so already, let me encourage you to go back, listen to Pastor Josh's sermon. It was excellent from last week where he covers this particular story. That story starts in verse 41, 42, and then it picks up in 49 through 56. But smashed in the middle of that story of Jared's daughter, being healed is this story, the one we're looking at here today. Jairus' daughter is dying, remember. This is an urgent medical situation. And while Jesus is on his way to heal her, he is interrupted by someone else who desperately needs help. Now, for those of you with multiple children, actually one child would probably be enough for this, who maybe at times clamor for your attention Okay, or needs you to provide for them, uh, needs you need something from you. When I read this, I kind of feel like at some point Jesus is going to go, All right, guys, all right, guys, one at a time, one healing at a time. Okay, I'll get to you, I'll get to you, I'll get to you. But he doesn't do that. Now, something Pastor Josh mentioned in his sermon last week that rang true with me on a very deep level is when he talked about how easy it is for us to be overwhelmed with the needs around us. Like, I feel that as a husband. I feel that as a father, certainly. And I feel that as a pastor. Um, Let me just say this. The the spiritual need here at Highview um, can sometimes feel completely overwhelming. Uh, We have around 250 adult members of this church now. There are another 120, 130 children of those members. By God's grace, we have a steady stream of people in the process of joining as members. Attendance here at Highview since January, when we were in the older building before this was created, it's up 54%. There's just, there's just more people. On top of that, we're di- dispersed geographically um, in a really wild way. We, we cover eight counties of West Georgia, okay? Eight counties. Now, let me factor this in, too. We have six elders currently serving. Lord willing, uh, we're going to vote as a church to install a seventh elder at our December 3rd church and conference. We need at least a dozen new gospel community groups to start up just to get every member of this church connected to one. 
Like the, the amount of spiritual need we're called to minister to in this body. And I don't just mean called as pastors to minister. I mean, you as members are called to minister to. Is increasing all of the time, which means high view must do three things. Pray for and raise up leaders. Two, develop and every member a disciple culture where everyone owns the spiritual need in the church. And thirdly, and most importantly, I would add this. We must learn to rest in the sufficiency of Jesus as our good shepherd. If you don't do one and two, if you don't want to pray for more leaders, if you you don't want to uh, help contribute to developing a culture where everyone's a disciple and everyone's making disciples, at least do that third one. For your own spiritual well-being, do that third one. This is true whether have you was five people or 50 people or 500 people, whatever. Here's the truth. Highview could add 20 more pastoral staff, bring on 30 more elders, 40 more deacons, and launch 50 new gospel community groups and still come up infinitely short of providing for you what only Jesus can provide for you. The task of every member of this church is ultimately to point others to Jesus. Not themselves. To get the focus away from us and onto Christ and his finished work. The minute you start looking for fallen people to make you spiritually okay, and ultimately those people are not Jesus, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. I'll never forget a few years ago, myself and another pastor, we're sitting in a pretty uh, intense pastoral counseling session with a member going through a very painful life situation that we've been trying to help them work through for months and months and months and months and months. And at one point in the session, they just blurt out, I'm angry with Highview. So can you explain that? I'm disappointed, they said, in you guys because you can't fix this. And here's the truth. They were right. They were right. The two sinners in that room sitting on the other side of that desk could not fix them. Only Christ can fix us. That's it. That's it. Our job was to point them to the one that could fix them, not fix them. Does that make sense? One of my favorite lines about pastoral ministry, and I've used this many, many times, is when a pastor, he met a guy on a plane, and the man asked him, what do you do for a living? And he told him, I'm a pastor. And the guy says, oh, so you're the guy who has all the answers. And the pastor said, no, I'm the guy who points to that guy. Like That's what we do. That's not true of just pastors. That's true of every blood-bought child of God in this room. You, in your fallen nature, have very limited resources to provide the broken and the hurting, but you have Christ, and that's all you need. The truth is, listen, anyone who tries to fill Jesus' shoes in your life is a fraud, and anyone who expects someone to fill Jesus' shoes in their life is a fool. Have you? You're only going to be able to enjoy the beauties and joys of the local church when you embrace the reality that the source of all those beauties, all those joys, is Jesus. There's no substitute for knowing the sufficient Christ we serve. No one else can make you whole. A pastor can't do it. A spouse can't do it. Children can't do it. Careers can't do it. Financial security can't do it. It is Christ who heals. It is Christ who saves. It is Christ who gives you peace. It is Christ who gives you an identity you can rest in. Both Jairus and this young woman with the issue of blood had both brought their needs to the right place. That's what I'm saying. But the need was very real, and that leads us to part one, interrupting Jesus. Look at me at verse 43 there in chapter 8. There was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years, and though she had spent all of her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. Now, there's some interesting parallels and key differences between these two healing stories here. One pastor notes, quote, the man's name is given, Jairus, but the woman is anonymous. Jairus was a wealthy leading citizen, but the woman was a lowly person who had spent all of her money trying to get well. 
Jairus, who had been blessed with 12 years of joy with his daughter, and now might lose her, while this woman had experienced 12 years of misery because of her affliction, and now she was hoping to get well. Here was a man interceding for his child on one hand, and a woman hoping to get help for herself. And both came to the feet of Jesus. From society's perspective, these two people uh, could not have been on further ends of the spectrum. And it's a reminder. You cannot externally evaluate someone's brokenness. You never truly know what a person is going through. Despite how altogether they appear. You never know what someone's struggling with from a sin perspective. You never know the trauma or the suffering they've experienced or are currently enduring. It is so easy to look at a person externally or observe the nice things they have or the the well-behaved children that they have and come to the conclusion they've got it all together. But, listen, suffering and brokenness are not contained by social status or financial security. Some of the most messed up people I know have a lot of money. A lot of stuff. No one is immune to reality of life in a fallen world. The wealthy Jairus, this poor anonymous young woman, they have very different lives, but they share one critical point of connection. Both have a need only Jesus can meet. Have you listened to me? You, this is why this is so important to understand, you have never met a person that did not need Jesus. Never. Never. You've never met a person good enough to not need Jesus. You've never met a person wealthy enough to not need Jesus. You've never had a person moral enough to not need Jesus. You know, I can tell if someone needs Jesus, they're breathing. The truth is, sin levels us all, doesn't it? It puts us all in a state of neediness. God sees both Jairus and this young woman both as needy, suffering sinners. Romans 2, verse 11, the Apostle Paul writes, For God shows no partiality. Now, I prefer the ESV, but the King James here actually gets it closer to correct, I believe, from a translation standpoint. In in the old King James Version, it says, for there is no respect of persons with God. You've heard this, God is no respecter of persons. In other words, God is never in awe of anyone, no matter how impressive they may be to us. God is never in awe of anyone. He's no respecter of persons. Have you, isn't it obvious that this world desperately needs a biblical anthropology. That is a biblical view of humanity. Both Jarius, both this young woman, sinners, suffering, broken sinners. Like we need to see the unique value and worth of human beings as creatures made in the image of God. We also need to see human beings as broken sinners in need of Christ. We simultaneously, in our culture, have a view of humans that is in some ways too low. We do not value human life, for example. And in some ways, far too high. Like a biblical view of humanity will do three things. One, it'll increase our compassion for fellow sinners. You'll see we're all level at the foot of the cross, if you will. It'll also keep our expectations in check for fellow sinners. And third and finally, it'll lessen our fear of what fellow sinners think about you. We must see the common humanity of these two people in these miracles. 
like the rich ruler of the synagogue, this young woman, is at the end of her rope. As a matter of fact, I would say if desperate was a person, this young woman would be it. Look at verse 43 again. There's a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years, and though she had spent all of her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. First and foremost, this woman is a woman. That's what the text says. There was a woman. Now, women in the ancient world were always in a state of vulnerability. In first century Palestine, women were particularly vulnerable. It was a very harsh place for women. Women with chronic illness like this woman had would have been among the most vulnerable in that society. And that's exactly what this woman was. She had an issue described as a discharge of blood. Now, there's a lot of speculation about this woman's medical condition, but the best guess is some type of uh, uterine hemorrhage. Interestingly, one pathologist I read chimed in that this woman probably had also suffered from, quote, iron deficiency anemia, which typically leads to severe fatigue. This woman was drained in every possible way, weak, weary, and no one could help her. In Mark's account, he actually takes a few shots at the physicians that this woman had sought for help. Mark says this in Mark 5, 26, pointing out that she had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had, and then he adds this, and was no better. She actually grew worse. It's interesting how the different writers of Scripture, all under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they give their unique take on the story. Luke says the physicians could not heal the woman. He's like, they tried and they couldn't do it. Mark says, these physicians made her illness worse. Bunch of crackpots. It's basically what Mark says. Now, why would Mark have that take and Luke have a different take that's a little easier on physicians? Luke was a physician. <laughs> Luke goes a little easier on the doctors because he was one. Mark's more like, these quacks, these swindlers? Awkward. But anyway, some of the remedies prescribed to the woman in the ancient world for uterine hemorrhage would have included drinking a goblet of wine containing a powder compound of rubber, alum, and garden crocus. I don't know why that didn't work, but it didn't work. Uh, another treatment included drinking wine mixed with cooked onions, and then a doctor would shout at the young woman as she drank this concoction, arise out of your blood flow. That didn't work either. The end result, she was still sick, and broke. Sadly, it's always been expensive to be sick. And in the ancient world, it, it could literally destroy your life. Her sickness was worsening and her bank account was lightening all at the same time. And believe it or not, that wasn't the extent of her condition. What made matters worse is this. Because of her blood issue, she was perpetually, ceremonially unclean. According to Leviticus 15, verses 19 through 27, a bleeding woman was unclean for as long as the bleeding continued. What that means is, not only would she have been banned from entering the temple or to participate in public worship, she was not allowed to touch or be touched by other people as anyone she touched would also have been considered unclean. One commentator made this note, quote, this woman's alienation was profound. She was an outcast. Out of necessity, she had pulled away from all physical contact, including members of her own family. It had been 12 long years since anyone had embraced her. 12 years is a very long time. There's something about long-term suffering that's particularly soul-crushing, isn't it? 
like suffering that won't stop. Chronic suffering, if you will. Like it's one thing to suffer for a season and we can kind of grit our teeth and bear it. But to suffer with no end in sight is a different kind of suffering. And this woman had endured that. One of the darkest times in my life when Kaylee and I were experiencing like one catastrophic loss after another. Like I remember thinking, it was kind of surprising, but I remember thinking, yeah, it hurt and it was all those things. But I remember thinking, this is lonely. Like it's lonely in here. Like this place where this kind of suffering happens, people don't will like usually willfully enter into with you. So you feel that much more alone. Some of you are in a season just like that. Suffering has a way of isolating you. At first, by necessity. But let's also be honest, eventually it becomes by choice too. You look for ways to continue to isolate. Perhaps that's where some of you are today. Suffering, at least long-term suffering, forces you to often withdraw from social places and spaces and community. And then that becomes the new norm. Like that becomes your safe place. Like some weird, dark stuff can happen in your heart if you isolate long enough. We just weren't made to be alone. And this desperate woman shows us what to do when we are in that place, we reach out to Jesus. And that's what she does. In verse 44, she came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. And immediately her discharge of blood ceased. So Jesus is being mobbed by a crowd of people here. He's on his way to the home of Jairus to heal his dying little girl. And this woman has heard about Jesus' ability to heal, clearly. And she sees an opportunity. She sneaks up behind Jesus as he's making his way through this crowd. And she reaches down and she touches one of the tassels that is on his cloak, okay? Thinking that if I can touch his robe, particularly that part of his robe, that might be enough to heal me. Now, All along, she's hoping no one knows about this, that no one sees this. And as soon as she touches the tassel, she's healed. She's healed immediately. Like, no, repeat after me. No, 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 no. Like, the power of Jesus heals her immediately. So she had to be in disbelief. Overjoyed even, like, Frightened, though, having felt the power of God come out of this man's robe into her broken body, healing it instantaneously. So she's got to be shaken. She's, she's got to be distraught. And on top of that, like, she got away with it, right? Like, she, she got what she wanted from Jesus, which was the healing. She didn't want to stick around to hear him talk. She just wanted the healing. And now she could be on her way. Mission accomplished, right? Read verse 45 with me. And Jesus said, who was it that touched me? Insert the sound effect where the record stops suddenly. Whoops. Now, um, keep in mind, Jesus in this scenario, he's like a first responder or something. He's on his way to heal a little girl that, according to her distraught dad, is about to die. And and, and actually, as you recall, hopefully from last week's sermon, the little girl apparently did die. And here, Jesus intentionally allows himself to be interrupted from dealing with an emergency. But, But of course, like this happened all of the time to Jesus. Here's what we need to know. The way Jesus was interrupted and the way we are interrupted are very different. Let me explain. I'm going I'm to read a, a quote from a very famous commentator. Again and again during his earthly ministry, Jesus was interrupted. 
namely in his speaking to a crowd, Luke 5, I mentioned that earlier, conversing with his disciples in Luke 12, sleeping, of course, praying and traveling. The fact, listen to this really carefully, that none of these intrusions floor him, not for a moment is he at a loss for what to do, what to say, shows that we are dealing here with the Son of Man who is also the Son of God. What we would call an interruption is for him a springboard or a takeoff point for the utterance of a great saying or is here for the performance of a marvelous deed revealing his power, wisdom, and love. End quote. Don't miss this. For Jesus, interruptions were divinely orchestrated opportunities that he embraced as a part of the Father's sovereign plan. I was thinking about this throughout the week. Often, what I see as an interruption happens when my plan for my life does not align with God's plan for my life. So, I have a plan. Here's what my day was going to look like. And God said, no! I had a plan for what my year was going to look like. And God said, no, that's not what we're going to do. We're going to do something else. I call that an interruption, but it's actually not from the perspective of God. It's the unfolding of his sovereign, perfect plan. I'm just upset. His sovereign plan is not willing to bend to mine. do this a lot. We say things like, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. And God says, no, you aren't actually. James 4, 13 through 15 says, come now you say today or tomorrow, we're going to go and do such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this. Or do that. It's living with a Godward perspective. There's a difference in di- divine interruptions and carnal distractions. Those are not the same things. Interruptions redirect us towards God's purpose for our lives, which is to bring Him glory. Distractions rob us of purposeful action. Funny enough, <laughs> while I was writing this section on this sermon at my home office. My two-year-old came bounding in, wanting me to hold her because she fell and was sad. That is an interruption, not a distraction. That created an opportunity to show my daughter she has a loving father hopefully pointing her subconsciously as it may be to the reality that she has a loving heavenly father, right? Also, that doesn't mean I wasn't annoyed that I had to stop what I was doing. The question is whether I'm willing to embrace the interruption God sovereignly planned for his purpose. But she's not a distraction. 20 minutes later, after I started on this, uh, back on the sermon, um, I had my phone across the room. I'm trying to look at my phone while I'm doing this. I'm really trying to like do some focused work here. And I keep hearing the email, bing, 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 bing. And, and it's like, it, it's like I, I have to go see who's sending me these emails. I was so tempted to stop what I was doing and pick up the phone. That's a distraction. Okay? Interruption, distraction. Church, we need the Holy Spirit's guidance to know the difference. We need renewed minds informed by the word to know what is valuable and what is vanity. A friend calling you while you're watching the UGA game asking for prayer is a divine interruption, not a distraction. A non-believer striking up a conversation about the gospel with you on a plane is a divine interruption. It's not a distraction from your smartphone. Jesus never missed an opportunity the Father had ordained in his divine plan for his life. He was so perfectly in sync with the Father's will that he was willing to walk through an open door 
even if it meant going the long way around. Put it that way. My prayer for myself, my prayer for this church, is that we will learn to become excited when God interrupts our plans instead of anxious when he does so. But also that we might memorize Proverbs 16, verse 9. The heart of a man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. Make your plans, make your plans. Just know God reserves the right to always interrupt them. Jesus was interrupted, but it was a divinely appointed interruption. And that leads to part two, healing power. The woman touches the tassels on Jesus' robe and is healed instantly. And what happens next is almost comical. As soon as she touched Jesus, he responds. Verse 45, Jesus said, who was it that touched me? Now, um, everyone who heard Jesus say that immediately had to think he was joking. He's in the middle of a mob that's all trying to get to him. He's being pressed on all sides. Lots of people are touching him, actually. And then, <laughs> it's the most Jesus thing ever. Jesus, everyone's touching him, everyone's pushing on him, pressing on him, and then he feels this woman touch the tassels of his robe and power go out from him, and he goes, stop! Who touched me? Like, that's such a Jesus thing to do. It really is. Who touched me? Now, <laughs> the response Jesus gets is hilarious. Okay? It's hilarious, and you'll miss it if you just skim past it in your daily Bible reading, okay? Check this out. Um, the text says that first, all denied it. <laughs> Just one little detail that is only in the Bible because it actually happened. Everyone is touching Jesus. Everyone. So Jesus asks, who's touching me? And they all go, I don't know. It wasn't me, clearly. It wasn't me. Bunch of liars. They lie to Jesus' face, no less. If you want to understand the wickedness of humanity. But then finally someone speaks up, and you'll never guess which disciple pipes up when everybody's like, I don't know who touched you. It would be Peter. You're right. Of course. Verse 45. When all denied it, <laughs> Peter said, Master, the crowd surrounds you and are pressing in on you. Let me paraphrase. Peter says, with all due respect, Jesus, that's kind of a dumb question. We're all touching you. That's what he says. Jesus' response is mysterious, verse 46. But Jesus said, someone touched me, for I perceive that power has gone out from me. In other words, someone touched me in a different way than all you clowns are touching me. She touched me in a different, unique way. And he says, I perceive that power has gone out from me. Now, this statement raises all kinds of questions. For example, can Jesus heal people unknowingly? Like, or, like, how does this power work? Do, do you have to physically touch him? Can you be in a room with him? Can you just kind of snuggle up to him? Can you rub shoulders with him and get healed? How does this work? It, 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 it asks a lot of questions, and after doing a pretty deep dive into the Greek, and then I read nine commentaries on this statement, let me offer you a summary of what scholarship has to say about what happened here. I don't know. I, I don't know how that worked. And, and I think the only consensus is that no one really gets how that worked. But Jesus gives us a little bit of a glimpse into how his divinity works with his humanity. It's mysterious stuff. This verse, though, it pulls us close to the edge of what we can know about the natures of Christ. But I do think Luke wants us to make sure we don't miss the bigger picture here. Jesus is going to use the healing of this woman as a gospel illustration. 
In other words, the story of her physical healing is going to point to the deeper reality of her spiritual healing. Jesus calls the woman out. That's what happens in verse 47. Who touched me? And everybody's like, it wasn't me, it wasn't me, it wasn't me, it wasn't me, it wasn't me. And Peter's like, everybody's touching you. And finally, verse 47, the woman saw that she was not hidden. She came trembling and she fell down before him, declared in the presence of all the people why she touched him and how she had been immediately healed. I want to draw your attention to uh, four English words in a verse. She was not hidden. Four incredibly powerful words under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Luke chooses to use here. For the first time, in a very long time, this woman was seen. Her existence was acknowledged. She wasn't a ghost. She wasn't a mist, a vapor, whatever. She was a human being suffering alone for a very long time. And Jesus didn't look right through her. He didn't number her with the crowd, as it were. He says, I see you. You. Everybody's touched him, but one touched him differently, and he points this out. Do you know what most suffering people want more than anything? Like, almost as much as they want their suffering removed, they want to be seen. And for someone who's suffering... Being seen can be scary. In order to be seen, don't miss this, she couldn't hide anymore. And here's the truth. Often, often, we're not seen because we're enduring suffering and suffering isolates. And then, here's the other truth about it. Um, We want to hide. That's the natural human inclination. We want to isolate. We want to hide. We don't always want to be seen, but we desperately need to be seen. She couldn't hide anymore. She knew it. She she knew she couldn't hide anymore. So she came trembling, the text says. In order to be seen, she had to do the really hard work of identifying herself. She had to do the really scary work of coming to Jesus and falling down at his feet. A sign of worship. And she confesses her uncleanliness. She confesses that Jesus has healed me. Church, that's what faith looks like. She didn't have all the answers, but she knew enough to come and reach out to Jesus and bow before Jesus and to confess that Jesus and Jesus alone had made her whole, had made her clean. Kent Hughes, he writes this, quote, her faith was uninformed, superstitious, presumptuous, and imperfect, but it was real. And Christ honored her fledgling faith God does the same thing today. Beginning faith is often uninformed and mixed with errors and misconceptions about, for example, Christ's person, the Trinity, the atonement, grace, works, the scriptures, but foggy understandings are often the true beginning of an authentic, informed trust in God. We can take courage in the fact that we do not have to have everything figured out doctrinally in order to possess a faith that pleases God. And thanks be to God for that. How do we know that her weak, immature faith was a saving faith? Verse 48, Jesus said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Go in peace. There's no more enmity. There's no more strife. You can go in peace. Interestingly, this is the only woman in the New Testament Jesus addresses as daughter. 
And I, and I wrestled with that for a little while. And as a father to three little girls, man, this hit me really hard for some reason. There was something so beautiful, so tender about Jesus calling this woman daughter. Daughter. After all, this woman had been ostracized as unclean for so long, estranged from her family, almost certainly from her own earthly father. And Jesus has this one-on-one moment with her. (laughs) And he calls her something she probably had not been called for a really long time. She calls him, he calls her daughter. Daughter. What a beautiful picture of grace this is. There are many mysteries to this passage. But here's what I know. Here's what I know. Everyone in this room, myself included, apart from Christ, is unclean. Unclean. Like the woman in the story, we've all sought something other than Christ. Everything but Christ to make us happy, to to make us whole. Like we've sought money and comfort and success, or maybe you've sought marriage and children to make you feel okay, to make you feel clean. And it all comes up short. Like it it leaves us feeling more isolated, alone in our brokenness. Sin, remember, levels the playing field. But here's what else I know. Anyone in this room who is willing to reach out to Christ and by faith lay hold of his righteousness will be made clean and welcomed into the family of God. Why did this woman reach out and touch the corner of Jesus' robe? Because on the four corners of the cloak were these tassels, the tassels representing the righteousness of the one who wore it. So here's the gospel. When unclean sinners like us reach out for the righteousness of Christ by faith, Jesus doesn't become unclean. We become clean. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this glorious news that sinners are made clean when they reach out to you by faith. Even imperfect, small, weak, unimpressive faith. The faith the size of a mustard seed is enough. And so God, now my prayer is that everyone in this room who's reaching for anything else to make them feel whole would see the vanity of that search in anything other than Christ. Holy Spirit, would you grant faith and repentance now in this room by a work that only you can do? And we ask this in the name of Christ. All God's people.